And the next panel is something that is dealing with European issues and also sheds light on the crisis that we are currently in, the COVID-19 crisis. But we also would like to look at what this crisis has done with Europe and to Europe, and how did it change Europe? Are there new alliances? Are there new constellations that came about in this crisis? And for this, we put together a panel. We have three more guests, apart from Gert Mark, that we would like to welcome. And for this panel, I will switch languages with Gert Mark. We spoke German. Next panel will be in English. So the, ne the title of the next panel, and hello, now there, there are, the, are, the, are the other guests. Um, so I warmly welcome um, two other guests, and another guest will be placed here in the room. I warmly welcome Alexander Stubb. In the center, you see him in the center, hello. Uh, he is director of the School of Transnational Governments at the European University Institute uh, in Florence. Between 2008 and 2016, he served as Prime Minister, Finance Minister, Foreign Minister, Trade and Europe Minister of Finland. And he was a member of the European and Finnish Parliament, Chairman of the Finnish National Coalition Party and Vice President of European Investment Bank. A warm welcome to you. Thanks to have you here. Vielen Dank. The, freut mich sehr. <laughs> then, here in the room now, next to me, is Nora Bossong. She is a German writer who writes poems, novels and essays. For her literary works, Bossong has been awarded several prizes. Most recently, her novel Schutzzone was published by Surkamp and longlisted for the German Book Prize of the Year. Welcome. And uh, a welcome there, also on the digital floor, is Justine Justin Vais, founder and director general of the Paris Peace Forum. He previously led the Center for Analysis, Planning and Strategy at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He served as, as director of research at the Brookings Institution in Washington, where he focused on transatlantic relations and European foreign policy. And Gert Mark, we know him already. Welcome to every, all of you. We already discussed the great picture. Now we will go more into detail. The title of this panel is No Longer Best Friends Forever, Alliances and Divisions in a Changing Europe. We have the three crises, we discussed them before, 2008, the Euro crisis, 2015, the refugee crisis, and most recently now, the health crisis. The European idea was harmed and gave way to populist movements, gave way to extremist parties. The European project seems to be in danger. Now, Alexander Stubb, COVID made the EU, EU falling back into old nation state reflexes, reflexes, borders closed, my country first, no, or first, a very helpless European crisis management. Is the EU only for sunny times? And what can we do? What can the EU do to, uh, to be more resilient? Well, thanks for the question. I actually fundamentally disagree with the premise. Uh, having been involved in the financial crisis uh, and in the migration crisis as part of the Finnish government, as foreign minister later, prime and finance minister, I think Europe was quite slow to react to those two crises. Uh, for instance, in the Euro crisis, it took four years to establish the European Stability Mechanism, the ESM. Whereas in the COVID crisis, yes, the two, three first weeks were very inward looking. So the member states, the nation states basically got scared as one does, uh, started closing borders, uh, starting putting up impediments for the free movement of goods services and people but after that i think the coordination was fairly good and let me finish with this point within four months the european union had set up through the european central bank its pep program uh, through the european investment bank its 25 billion program for small and medium-sized businesses uh, through an executive decision uh, changing the European stability mechanism from essentially a financial instrument to a health instrument through the European Commission establishing the trust and share programs and finally the icing of the cake the biggest rescue package in the history of the European Union in the form of next generation Europe and an early decision on the MFF if you top that up with the fact that Europe was able to negotiate vaccine procurement 
and then start distributing those vaccines both internally and externally. I would actually argue that the European Union is not for good weather, it's for bad weather, and it's done an excellent job this time around. Thank you, Mr. Stubb. That's a very optimistic view on what has happened and how the Europe, uh, you tackled the crisis. Um, you nodded at one point, just Don Weiss. Is, it, is that the point you are taking too? Is the, Euro, is the European Union now fit for crisis management? Uh, you know, it's both for good and bad weather. Uh, in, in Greek mythology, uh, Athena was born uh, in full armor, fully equipped uh, from the forehead of Zeus. Uh, uh, and that's not how Europe was born, right? Europe was born by compromises. It was born by political adjustments from all these different countries. And it was created through the crisis. It's almost a, a cliche, but from the, the Balkans to the 2005 referendums to the Euro crisis, the refugee crisis, the Brexit crisis, the COVID-19 crisis. Each time, these crises were a way to build a stronger Europe and to complete the equipment, the armor that it needed. And so I think if we take the, uh, the sort of, not necessarily the long-term view, but at least the medium-term uh, view, we see each time people betting against Europe, saying that this crisis would destroy Europe, and each time Europe, you know, slowly, clumsily, finding the ways to respond pretty much in the way that Alex just uh, outlined. Thank you, uh, Mr. Weiss. Uh, Mrs. Bossong, um, is that your impression? Is the European, did, did the EU grow with the crisis and especially, or did the EU grow with a different crisis and now is ready to fight these problems and the, uh, the problems uh, of, of being scattered of the problems of nationalism? Are we at that good point uh, the, the speakers just um, pointed out? Well, uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for the optimistic perspectives because I'm more the pessimistic <laughs> person. Uh, what we can see, at least in Germany, is that the nationalistic party AFD uh, lost. Uh, well, if, if we look at the uh, at the, at the um, election in, in September, so the the main topics of uh, the nationalistic populistic party are not th that strong in this moment but i would say that uh, during all these three crises um, the nationalistic views won on the long run uh, the the idea of a europe that is united uh, is every time when when people talk about it at least uh, in, in, the, in, in Germany, I, I see that very clearly, uh, is a very nationalistic point of view. So we have the German Europe, we have the French Europe, we have the uh, Spanish Europe. So uh, I don't really see the great narrative of a united, uh, united Europe. And I think that this crisis, the, the health crisis that we have now, is the one uh, crisis that will uh, tell us if Europe has a future and if it works then Europe has to grow, the EU has to grow, Other, otherwise it will not work, probably. Um, Gerd Mark, um, di is the, did the Covid crisis accelerate the integration of the European Union in the way also we discussed it in the, in the, in the first panel? Is there are you hopeful that this will help um, to make the EU a more resilient uh, organization? I think yes, in, in, on the Brussels level, for sure. Uh, what's said before, it is a, really a learning organization and sometimes a surprising fast learning organization. Uh, on the other hand, when I look at the national level, uh, uh, and I must say, especially at my own country, um, there you see the European paradox. Uh, that uh, this happens always again when something when something is going well. The national politi politicians uh, say we did it, and when thing when something goes wrong, then Europe gets all the blame. And uh, I was shocked, really shocked. And I know in other countries it can be different, but we had just uh, uh, elections, a lot of debates. Europe was almost not mentioned. While on European level, indeed, the last month, unbelievable things happened. 
beginning mistakes, but later on things went better and better and better. Uh, but when I uh, go into one of these halls and get my first uh, vaccine, uh, nobody is talking about Europe. Nobody. It, it, uh, and that is really um, very difficult and very strange. Uh, and uh, it is not a problem uh, often of the press. There, uh, Europe, there's a lot, written a lot of Brussels and of Europe, but the public debate, especially in my country, and especially in this situation, Europe doesn't play a role. And that is a great resp responsibility of the national politicians. They push it away. And uh, I don't know if it can go on forever this way, because, uh, uh, yeah, everybody is also afraid for... Uh, populist and nationalist, but also the, the, let me say, the normal parties play their own role in that field. And I think, uh, again, a lot of countries are a little different, but in my country, we are perhaps the most European country. We are dependent of everybody and everything, connected with everything. And at the same time, we love to play the role as Great Britain to be separated from the continent as much as possible. Uh, Mr. Stubb, do, do you agree that we have to talk, or the countries, politicians have to talk more positively about Europe and um, make the European Union a, a better success story? And how do you explain with your positive view um, on how the European Union did tackle the COVID crisis so far? How do you explain that societies nowadays seem to be more divided? and the populist parties and extremist parties and movements are gaining. And how do you, um, how could, could the European Union help to overcome these fractions and divisions within the countries? Well, I guess a starting point is to say that uh, I think speaking positively or putting forward a positive narrative about the European Union is always an uphill battle. And the reason for that is very simple, and I can say this as a former national leader. When things go bad, you blame Brussels. When something good happens, you take the credit yourself. So, for instance, if the European Union, in this particular case, the European Commission, is able to negotiate and procure uh, X number of vaccines, which small member states like Finland, for instance, would never have been able to do, you know, the Finnish Prime Minister is not going to give credit to the European Commission. She's going to take credit or he's going to take credit uh, for doing the distribution. The second issue that we have here, um, in, in, in my mind, uh, is, is, is basically an issue of, of perception of the European Union. I think the European Union always works in three phases. The first phase uh, is a crisis. The second phase is chaos. And then the third phase is a suboptimal solution. So, you know, we sort of have to learn to live with the fact that the European Union is not some kind of a utopia which is going to provide you with perfect public goods from the beginning to the end. Uh, quite the contrary. And, and, and this is a perception, I think personally, that we need to start changing if Europe is to be brought back on track. My third and final point on this is that you know, I think we've moved from the politics of ideology to the politics of identity, especially in Western societies. So, you know, pre-Cold War, it was all about ideology. You had, you know, Soviet Union, communism, the United States, capitalism and democracy on one side. Uh, then as we started to move into a post-Cold War world and hit the year 2008, which you mentioned in your introduction, then people started to quest question the system. And when you start questioning the system, you probably drop ideology and move towards identity. The problem here is we all have an identity, but it's much more difficult to negotiate and compromise on your personal identity than it is on an ideology. And that's probably one of the big dilemmas that we have, and that's one of the reasons that we're seeing a lot of nationalist movements uh, merging all around in Europe. Would there be the solution, and I will ask that to Noah Bosong, the solution to create a European identity? Is that a solution to the problem, and how can we, how can we, um, how can we do it? Well, the problem... The European identity, sorry, the European yeah. identity comes in the Eurovision Song Contest. You've had a try. It's <laughs> probably right. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem with, uh, with the identity uh, that we talk about now is 
uh, that we have all these little groups that want their own identity and it's not a unifying identity that we are talking about right now, that uh, the identity politics. So uh, I think to construct a European identity is a totally different story. And uh, what we have to, to see is that identity is complex, identity is ambivalent, uh, identity is not a close room uh, where, where everything fits. Uh, so um, I think what we uh, need is a story that tells Europe with all these uh, different historical backgrounds, with all uh, the different ideas, also with uh, different ideologies. And uh, I, I'm not really sure if ideology is, uh, is vanishing. Uh, I think we still have ideological ideas, and not only in a bad manner. Um, and, but to, to, to focus on the, on the story that we can talk, uh, tell about Europe, that's one point. The other point is uh, how does Europe work? And I think that if we look at the big projects, there's still so much uh, different interest between the national interest, where, where as, as it was said, the, the politicians want to be elected. So uh, we have the uh, dem democratic uh, elections that are still much more important on a national basis. Uh, and we will always focus on nation national entities when it, when it comes to, 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 the, to the real battles in, 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 in politics. So I think it's, it's always nice to tell the European stories, but we have the, the, the structure that does not follow these, uh, these stories. There's one question which perfectly fits into our discussion about identity. Um, it's from, and, uh, from the audience. <coughs> it's from Johannes Ahlefeld from the SPD Bundestagsfraktion, the German Bundestag, German Parliament. Um, e pluribus unum, how can we organize a common identity for the EU despite the trends towards a resurgence of nationalist sentiments? Can a European superstate come into existence without such a common sense of destiny? Justin Weiss, do you have an answer to that question? You know, if there is one engine, one system able to uh, combine the different identities, uh, it is the European Union. Uh, it was uh, designed uh, to combine uh, not only different governments and countries and nations, but opposing warring factions to reconcile them. Uh, as Gert said uh, uh, earlier, it was a project of peace among uh, people who had fought against one another. And so uh, I'm not saying that we're not living in a different age, the age of identity that we uh, mentioned just earlier, but I do think that the EU is this uh, subtle, uh, uh, you know, amalgamation machine, if you'd like, of different identities that can uh, allow to uh, make them uh, uh, coexist while still having a common uh, purpose. That might seem a bit idealistic, but what I see is uh, 27 different countries being able to work out their differences, once again very clumsily, but still able to overcome together the crises. And so I, I know there is no European identity. You're not going to die in a battlefield for uh, Charles Michel or for Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, that's not going <laughs> to happen anytime uh, soon. Uh, and so, so national identities will remain. But what do you see? polling after polling is that people are attached to the EU, that they are able to articulate different uh, senses of belonging, uh, belonging to your country, uh, belonging to the uh, EU, that it's making progress. And I take comfort in the fact that more and more question, more and more political questions are politicized, more, more and more European questions are politicized in France, for example. 20 years ago, uh, Europe was very much absent from the French political debate. It was remote. It was someplace else. It would be on the borders. Right now, many questions from vaccines to refugees and Brexit, etc., are discussed in the national arena. Europe is becoming politicized, and that's uh, good news. Um, Mr. Mark, um, the success story of the EU roots <clears throat> in an idealistic idea, um, especially of the post-war generation. Now, this generation 
is leaving uh, the floor. Um, what, what, how does it change uh, the European Union and what does it mean for the European Union that this idealistic idea might be, might be vanishing? Um, I don't know, I don't, honestly, because uh, we talked about identity and I think uh, people uh, are, have a feeling of togetherness when there is danger. And uh, uh, the danger was in the past, and that brought what I said before, a lot of Europeans and European leaders in some way together. Uh, something negative too, never again. Uh, I sometimes, I thought we have to put, uh, that was in the 50s, uh, before the Berlin building, also a statue of Joseph Stalin because uh, the European Union was also pushed together by uh, the fear of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the, let's say the, the, the problems and the danger are more complex. And I agree with the fact that there is no ideology anymore. It is just about identity. Uh, but identity, you cannot organize it. It is... Um, it grows and it comes together at, uh, in, in strange ways and strange situations. Um, and what helps me sometimes is to think about my own city, Amsterdam. There are so a lot of discussions about M the, the identity of Amsterdam and it is very difficult because Amsterdam is a t totally immigrant city, totally mixed with a lot of different identities and in fact and it's just like Europe the identity of Europe is formed by the differences by the dynamics between the different identi national identities so uh, uh, the thinking of one Europe is in fact uh, um, a contradictio in terminus because we are always different and that makes our that is also the we are not China is looks a lot alike. We are, and that give, makes also this continent also through the whole history, yeah, uh, uh, gives it a lot of dynamics. So we have to find a way to um, combine our, let's say, our local and national identities and the differences to, to, to place them in a, 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 in a identity like a city, like Amsterdam. We, because when you ask someone in Amsterdam, uh, when he comes from Holland or from Turkey or from Morocco or Suriname, when you ask them, they always say, no, perhaps I'm not a Dutchman, but I am an Amsterdammer. And that, I think, can be the same for Europe. When, we are in, when you are in North America or in Australia, you feel immediately that you have to do with someone from Europe. So. I think we have to to feel that better, and to that then it will develop through history in its own way. Um, Alexander Stubb, are the are the new alliances, <coughs> sorry, which are emerging, like the Frugal Four, like the well older already, like Visegrad or the Hanseatic, the new Hanseatic League, are these signs of like the new coalitions and new getting together, and that we are not stuck that much to what has been. Um, old-fashioned what has been historical is that a sign that that the uh, of progress and do we need these new alliances to make the EU um, a more resilient um, organization I guess yes and no but I mean I think the starting point is I'm I'm, I'm, I'm with Gert on this I I think we need to change the narrative but of course the European Union you know historically has existed for a few reasons their peace security stability and prosperity it's a great narrative it's a post-world war II narrative which works, but it doesn't work, uh, you know, with today's generation. There's sort of simply a detachment from the sentiment, the feeling and the destruction of the war. And I, I like the idea of putting up a statue of Stalin outside of, 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 of uh, Berlamo. Uh, second observation, I, I, I think in order for you to build a common identity, you quite often need a common enemy. And, and this is sort of unfortunate, but if we look, for instance, at polling, um, about the European Union uh, after Brexit and after the election of Donald Trump, it actually went up. And the reason was that, whoa, you know, we don't want Brexit to happen. 
or we don't want to necessarily see a Donald Trump in this. So, you know, it's quite often about externalities. Uh, then I come back to the notion of a personal identity. I mean, the, the problem is that we, we are prisoners of our personal identity. We can't help it. And I know in, in, a, in the academic and other language, we always talk about identity politics being somehow right wing. I, I don't think that's the case. You know, identity politics is all over the place. It's your own personal experience. So I come from a bilingual Finnish Swedish family in Finland. I have lived half of my life abroad, the other half in, in Finland. I've studied in the United States, the United Kingdom, in France, in Belgium, and now I live in Italy. I'm an avid pro-European, come federalist. That is my identity, and it's very difficult for me to detach myself from that identity. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the big problems. So we have to probably be a little bit more lenient, liberal and open about different types of identities. Um, my final point on this, I've never liked the idea of, you know, founding states versus new states, north versus south, east versus west. They're very nice journalistic uh, simplifications of a world that doesn't really exist in reality. So in the financial crisis, it was all about, you know, uh, the North versus the South, austerity versus solidarity. In the migration crisis, it was all about East versus West, West uh, about who is for immigration and asylum, who is against. And now in the COVID crisis, we're seeing this same sort of narrative. And I don't really like it. Uh, it was said earlier, a lot of the politicians have to be responsible to their electorate. Therefore, they react in certain sense. But there is no such thing as permanent coalitions inside the European Union. They are actually uh, very flexible throughout. So it's all about it's interest groups. So you call the so-called <clears throat> the so-called frugal four. You call an interest group. Well, I don't. You know, I don't. <clears throat> again, I, 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 I'm fortunately an academic, so so I can reject and say, please don't uh, put words in my mouth. I didn't say they're interest group, but I say that you know they try to drive a certain interest of what they would call their own electorate. And then they, you know, work together on a particular issue. But look, the frugal four, not even all of them are members uh, of the Eurozone. So you can't say that they have a certain identity. They do have a certain interest which they're driving right or wrong. Uh, Mr. Weiss, do you think we need alliances within the European Union? Do we need a core union maybe to have another velocity? Do you think, how do you think decisions should be taken and how important are alliances and coalitions and maybe also frictions um, to, to, to discuss different positions to make the EU successful? The good news here is that, you know, obviously like in any, any human uh, grouping that you would think of, there are parties, there are factions, there are alliances, there are uh, tensions, etc. The good news uh, is that, as Alex just outlined, there is no permanent divide. Uh, uh, it's not always north versus south or east versus west or frugal uh, versus uh, uh, more uh, uh, prone to spend uh, uh, and uh, have debt countries. So uh, that's the, uh, I would say, that's, that's a way to escape. Uh, the uh, divisions that could uh, really mean the, the end of Europe. We should be uh, thankful, in a sense, that that reality is not always pushing the same uh, tensions, etc. Now, of course, uh, uh, there is also even a virtue in having uh, countries push uh, towards uh, uh, certain, uh, certain goals and having uh, uh, allies, etc. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of... Uh, uh, you know, what we started with, what we started the discussion with, that is to say, Europe, uh, the EU was created for, uh, its original DNA was to make peace. And now it finds itself uh, at peace with itself, and we can be thankful for that. But it also finds itself in a world, uh, uh, you know, in a, a geopolitical world that is uh, tough, uh, a world uh, that, uh, uh, you know, is uh, very unforgiving with... Uh, super states uh, with China, with Russia, with uh, the US and others. And so uh, some countries and, and, and France among them is, is pushing for a more assertive, a more independent Europe. And I believe that's uh, what the, uh, uh, you know, the, the future of Europe, if we are to defend this incredible way of life uh, that we are offering to the rest of the world, the European way of life, we also need to be able to defend it, to assert it, to uh, defend it from uh, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, the excesses of big tech companies, the excesses of Russia, of China, uh, sometimes of the US. And so we have uh, here to find uh, a coalition of, of countries that are uh, willing and able to push that uh, forward and to make sure that we always will be able to reconcile that peace inside that European way of life, socially and economically, on the one hand, and uh, a place in the world that is respected by all. Uh, Nora Bosong, what, which role plays Germany in this like setup of alliances? There is this uh, Franco-German engine. There is sometimes a, the impression that Germany pushes forward some questions. Is is there a German kind of Sonderweg in this uh, European setup? And um, how important are these like old-fashioned alliances, uh, like old alliances? I have to have to say the like like the Franco-German one. I mean. I, I only have the, the German perspective, so uh, in my point of view, Germany is quite strong, sometimes I would say too strong uh, economically, but also uh, in a political um, sense. And uh, of course, for Germany, the Franco-German uh, alliance is always very, very important, historically, uh, not, uh, not only, but historically it was... Uh, it was a sign of uh, unification and a peaceful Europe. Um, I would say that uh, the discussion in Germany uh, goes, uh, 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 focuses on the question of responsibility. And uh, from, from the uh, historical background that was, uh, as we all know, very dark uh, in Germany, uh, the question is how far can the responsibility go? Also in, for example, military questions. Uh, and I, I sometimes I miss the European perspective. It's, it's very much focused on Germany, uh, how can German history shadow the, the responsibility nowadays? And uh, I would I would hope that in the, in the next years uh, we can we can open the view and think more uh, European about those questions, n not forgetting the the historic uh, background, of course, but uh, to see the, the the new aims and to to answer. In a, in a modern way, in a, in a European and uni unified way, and uh, but still, I see like the, the nationalistic borders, uh, national borders. Uh, maybe I see them too strong. Maybe uh, the other uh, other discussions here are a bit more um, relaxed uh, on that. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Weiss, how do you see how the the German French engine um, is it um, is it important? Is it still important? How important is it? And is it good for the European Union? Uh, you know, uh, even if it, in my, if I'm a risk of, of at the risk of uh, repeating a cliche, I think I think it's still very meaningful. I think it's still necessary, but it's not sufficient uh, in the sense that uh, there needs to be coalitions beyond this. I, you know, one, one anecdote or one, one example, uh, I was still uh, working uh, at uh, the Quai d'Orsay, at the Planungsstab, at the uh, policy planning at Quai d'Orsay, and I, I helped organize uh, the uh, visit by Xi Jinping uh, in uh, uh, France and in, in Europe in April 2019, two years ago. Uh, and uh, there was a very meaningful moment, which I think encapsulates what, what, what Europe should do and, and, and the face that it should present to Europe. And there was this meeting between Xi Jinping, uh, Angela Merkel, Emmanuel Macron, uh, and uh, the uh, 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 president of the uh, European uh, Commission uh, at, at the time. Uh, and, and, and that meant uh, all of the other uh, uh, EU countries. And so that was presenting a geopolitical face to the rest uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the world. And, and, uh, and it was based on uh, Franco-German uh, uh, cooperation, but it was not, it was going beyond this and it was uh, associating all of the other 25 uh, countries, I guess, or 26 uh, countries at the time. Uh, and so uh, that's, I think, what the, uh, what the face of Europe, the future of Europe could, could look like abroad. Uh, so necessary, but not sufficient. 
But then just one quick question, but just this, this year we just had a call, uh, like a video call between Xi Jinping, Macron and Merkel, but not the e European Union. So is that like, is it a step back what we saw this year? And isn't it not, it's not like a kind of, of that action, um, like generating more mistrust from other European nations, seeing that uh, Germany and France pushing something forward and Europe is not part of it? It, it, it all depends on the on the issues, uh, but yes, I do prefer it uh, uh, clearly when uh, when the EU is fully uh, is fully on board uh, uh, there. But but of course, you know, there is also those of pragmatism, and it depends on the uh, on the issues you're discussing. Um, Mark, I just want to look one step uh, once more, like backwards, and looking at like the historical um, perspective of these alliances. We have um, this new Hanseatic League. We have the Visegrad. Why do European states until today, use, uh, why are they using historical references and um, what for? What, what is the, what is, why do we need them and is, is it useful? The, uh, the historical references are of course part of our identity, national identities and uh, slowly on I think also European identities. Uh, because yeah, the, the, the past, especially the, the history of the Second World War and the Cold War, unites, unites us also and divides us too. But it is, it is like a fa in a family. Past is very important. But and we forget in this discussion, of course, uh, uh, not of course, but we forget the role of the United States uh, we're talking about Germany, about France, about stability in Europe, but till yeah, the beginning of this century, uh, we were uh, uh, in on the geopolitical field, uh, what I said, teenagers, and we lived under the umbrella of our uh, dear uncle, uh, Sam. And uh, that is changed totally. Um, European Union was also a, a project of the United States and of the, the politics of the United States in the second half of the 20th century. Now all the attention of the United States is, is going now to the Pacific instead of the Atlantic. And uh, Donald Trump was an extreme, extreme example. He hates the, the European Union and he hated especially Angela Merkel. but. Um, the, the, the attitude also under democratic presidents is more and more, uh, for them, Europe is not so interesting anymore. And uh, uh, we have to manage ourselves. Uh, and that is also in the geopolitical field. And that makes the role of uh, France, but especially of German, much more important. Uh, the, uh, uh, we cannot go back to Washington with our problems like we did till the, the end of the last century. But now, really, we have to go to Berlin and to Paris and to Warsaw. And, uh, and that's, that's, there is uh, not only on the military field, but also on the political field, slowly on a totally new situation is existing. And we have to find our own way, for instance, uh, uh, how we have to behave to uh, the, exp the, the, the problems the Russia is making all the time. How is our attitude to the fast expansion of China? Uh, 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 and so on and so on. And in also in that way, we have to reorganize organize ourselves. Sometimes, like, like for instance, the Belarusia crisis, it took quite a lot of time, not so much time as around, for instance, to Ukraine, but still before the European Union could react, because we are always with these 27 states. Uh, uh, in somehow we have to develop systems uh, that we can react faster and more united. Otherwise, we, we, we cannot survive crisis in the future. We are also geopolitical, not a teenager anymore. We are a super tanker, um, uh, but only, only with 27 uh, people in, on, on the steel wheel. 
Um, Mr. Stubb, is the EU ready to take the role as a, um, as a as a tanker, as the geopolitical tanker? If I look at like military capacities and uh, capabilities, um, I, 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 I doubt that. And um, is, is the European Union ready to find a way to deal with Russia, to deal with China, to, to, to be a, s a superpower in between um, or wherever uh, the United States and China? How, how, do you, how do you see the EU's uh, geopolitical role? Well, if you define geopolitics in what I would call old school terms, in other words, military, armaments, tanks, uh, soldiers, uh, missiles, and nuclear, the answer is no. But if you define geopolitics in what I would call modern terms, which basically means that the line between war and peace has been blurred, and geopolitics is as much about trade, technology, protectionism, immigration, information wars, climate, health, and many other issues, then my answer is yes. So I think that the European Commission has got it spot on when it has defined that its three priorities for this five-year term are three things, climate, tech, and geopolitics. Because what they're doing is they're redefining the parameters of what geopolitics means. You might call me an optimist and an idealist, but I think what we're seeing is the emergence of three blocks, China, the United States, and the European Union. And the question is who is going to come on top and at which state uh, in these uh, sort of three different uh, baskets. So my argument is that I'm, I'm a little bit, I'll be very frank with you, I'm a little bit sick and tired of this sort of eternal, sometimes extremely superficial narrative about the European Union and its incapacity to speak with one voice, et cetera. Et cetera. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's part of life. It's not easy stuff. But I think the European Union has all of, all of the instruments at the moment. Let me finish with one observation, which I think is key, where I'm not too optimistic about uh, the European Union, and that's the issue of data. I think data is not only the new oil and gold and, and, and the rest of it, but the way in which we use data, for instance, in uh, artificial intelligence, in, in algorithms, and also in robotization, is going to determine a lot of the power of these three blocks. And the approach to data between China, the United States, and the European Union is very different. I'm not saying wrong or right, but the fact is that China is mining data in a way in which it could never be done in the European Union. Data is seen as a public common commodity and good. The United States is a little bit less open about its data and does have a slightly stronger focus on privacy, albeit through its big tech companies. Whereas the European Union, paradoxically, is probably the most, may I use the word, capitalistic in its approach to data because it believes that data belongs to the individual. I personally think that it's a balance between these three. And we need to think about what is a common good in data and what is privacy. And I think this is where a lot of the big geopolitical debate in the future will be fought. Not so much with uh, military uh, equipment, more about data. Well, that could come together. Uh, Mr. Vais, uh, do you think that uh, the European Union is able to, to reform in a way that uh, gives to give, give data more opportunities to be used in a, in, a, in a more open way as it's used at the moment? And do you, do you agree with um, Mr. Stubb that uh, this is the key question of, of the century? Uh, yeah, well, that technology in general uh, is a question. Uh, I would enlarge it to, to other issues, but certainly data is, is central. And yes, there needs to be a balance between, uh, between these, uh, these different things. I also believe that uh, our own way, which is uh, the expression of our values, right? The way we authorize or do not authorize the, the use of data, the transfer of data, et cetera, is also reflective of, 
uh, what Europeans uh, think uh, of their uh, ideas and uh, ideals, uh, I, I would say. And so, and, and they also have the power and they've shown it. I don't want to, you know, overemphasize that, but they also have the, the power to uh, uh, impose certain restrictions. And let's say, you know, uh, the, the point I made earlier, that is to say, we are also offering uh, to other humans uh, uh, an example of, uh, you know, a different way to handle data. And that's not uh, negligible, right? Uh, it, we are showing that it's possible to be a bit more respectful of, uh, of, of users, of privacy, because it's linked to very important political considerations, uh, because it's an anthropological vision that other countries do not uh, necessarily share. But certainly what I would emphasize, and I'll, I'll finish with that, is uh, you know, this distinction uh, about geopolitics uh, between uh, high politics issues and low politics issues, as it's sometimes uh, called, uh, it was called in political science, for example. You know, yesterday evening, uh, uh, the EU was not able to agree on a declaration on Israel-Palestine. Uh, there were 26 uh, 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 votes uh, on, in, on one hand and one Hungary on the other hand. But, you know, does that... I agree with Alex. It's not. It's not that that bad. Uh, you know, what are the biggest risks that uh, uh, that we live to, through today? It's not a war with Russia. It's not a war with China. Uh, basically, uh, the, the biggest risks are uh, you know dying from from COVID nineteen, dying from a heat wave uh, because of climate, dying because your hospital has been cyber attacked and the emergency room is not working anymore. Uh, perhaps tomorrow uh, in, in space we'll have a big uh, collisions of satellites because orbits are clogged and there's a lot of debris. And so it will suddenly take all of the space infrastructure away that we depend on very much for geolocalization, communication, uh, etc. And these things can, can actually uh, kill people. And so, so the real risks to Europeans and other uh, uh, inhabitants of, uh, of the Earth are uh, you know, war and peace are is still central, and I, I'm not I'm not putting that into question. Security remains uh, 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 the first building block, but we should uh, pay attention to these issues that redefine geopolitics, the technological issues, the climate issue, the health issue, because yes, they are at the center of what we should uh, care about. Now I'll go back to the audience and um, ask a few questions because we have many. Um... And I will ask the question from Jörg Nellen from the Geschichtswettbewerb des Bundespräsidenten. Um, Nora Bossong, doesn't have the EU regained the confidence of its citizens in its problem-solving competence? In EU, we trust can become a part of one's transnational identity without endangering any regional or national part of it. Is that the way? Actually, I don't... Uh, could you repeat the question? Yes. It was a bit long. <laughs> Doesn't have the EU regain or doesn't have the EU, uh, EU regain the confidence of its citizens in its problem-solving competence. In EU, we trust can can become a part of one's transnational identity without endangering any regional or national part of it. Just setting it up on top of it. Well, yeah, that way, it, it's possible. I, I'm I'm not I'm not sure if it's uh, sufficient. And I would say, well, I'm, I'm the pessimistic uh, person here <laughs> on this podium. Uh, I don't, I don't see just uh, that China, for example, is, if you want to say, enemy. Uh, but it's a, it's a very, very strong power. And, and uh, for example, China is not only mining data. China is mining resources all over the world. China is uh, um, investing in Africa what the EU somehow forgot to, to do uh, in a sufficient way. Then the, the, the military um, complex is still extremely important and it's, it's connected with the question of data and data use. I mean, if you, if you have a very, very complex security system, uh, then you have to be on, on, on the ahead of time. You, you, cannot, you cannot defend yourself if you're in a technological way behind others. And, um, and there, if, if you look at, for example, the, the FCAS, uh, the, the European uh, idea of a security system that is um, engineered between France, Spain, and Germany, we, we have all these... Um, borders that are in our way. We, we are not really um, 
the the whenever the next step is uh, is taken we have national sensibilities and they, it is it is quite difficult to to go forward and uh, and th third thing is that i don't only see uh, the blocks uh, china us and europe also see a very strong brazil i see a very strong india i see a very strong pakistan and we have so many um, players geopolitical uh, that well still i think that it's not enough just to uh, say well uh, we can trust in Europe, we, we have to, of course, and we have to uh, make advertisement for, for Europe. I'm a very strong, forward, uh, pro-European person, but I think that is not enough. We, we, have, we still have to get new ideas and we still have to go on with the unifying process. And we're, we're, not, we're not at the, at the point where we can just relax and think, uh, oh, well, everything is going as it should. I have a, th thank you. I have another question which goes in a similar direction, and I will ask it. Um, I, w well, I was the question to Gerd Mark. Identity, from, it's the question is from Birte Förster from the University of Bielefeld. Identity is hybrid. You may have a local, regional, national, and transnational identity at the same time. I wonder if there can be any vision of Europe if we don't take Europe's global entanglement and its colonial past into account. Do you agree? I agree totally with that, yes. Uh, uh, th that becomes part of uh, our history, uh, but it is a struggle. And uh, uh, we were, and with reason, I think, the, the decades after the Second World War, historians also focused on the terrible disaster of the two wars in Europe. Uh, and and uh, yeah, looking for why was it happening and so on and so on. But now is the time to uh, look uh, more uh, at uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, the world politics uh, and what's uh, happened before. Uh, uh, I think also the, the way we, we are um, as, uh, as, as historians and also uh, intellectuals, uh, we were thinking for decades was very Euro-centered. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a logical thing. Uh, but I think it is also a good thing to, to, uh, to change that habit. And uh, because uh, the reality, and of course, history is always a discussion, but uh, there is another reality and a very important reality when you look outside Europa, Europe and, and, and think uh, and discuss about what happened there and how Europe influenced the rest of the, of the world and how the rest of the world influenced Europe. So, indeed, it is a question we can talk the whole morning about, <laughs> but we have to change our... I think it is important to change our focus and to... To, to make our focus wider and wider. Thank you. Um, we have a last round and um, a qu last question um, to all of you. So please um, answer as quick as possible as time is running. Um, we talk about the future role of the European Union. Mr. Stubb, um, what has to be done and what has to change that Europe can find its role in the world as you have described it, as the, the one, the superpower between uh, the one pole, which is the United States, and the other one, which uh, would be China? So what has to change and what do we have to do as European Union to find this role? I think a good starting point is to stop thinking about the European Union as some kind of a perfect utopia. Uh, it's more than a nation state, uh, sorry, it's more than an international organization, but less than a nation state. It's going to be very difficult for it to define its own identity, uh, but it should actually continue on its fairly functional path, which basically means that integration in one area leads to pressure to integrate in another one. And sometimes, I'll be very frank with you, it has to be reactive. If there's a climate crisis, deal with it. If there's a health crisis, deal with it. If there's a financial crisis, deal with it. And if there's a migration crisis, uh, deal with it. 
I think, I guess the key for survival for the European Union is not so much always speaking with one voice, but it's focusing on the right issues and in many ways muddling through. Final point, we human beings have a tendency to do three things. Number one, we over-rationalize the past. Number two, we over-dramatize the present. And number three, we underestimate the future. So I hope the European Union does not underestimate the future. Thank you, Mr. Stubb. Um, Nora Bosong, what is your take on this question? Well, I think that we have to realize that there's something to lose. And I think that's a point that we forgot in, in, the, in the past or in the last year, years. Um, for example, everybody was super surprised that the Brexit happened, that Trump was elected. So we now that we can lose. And I think that is a strong uh, idea. It's a strong point to move on. And we have something good that we can lose. And actually, we want to keep it. Justin Weiss. I would say two things. Uh, one, I think uh, very pragmatically, uh, Europe, and that will not surprise you from me coming from, uh, from France, uh, should get more strategic autonomy, it should be able to make its own decisions, it should be able to rely more on its own uh, uh, resources uh, in order to convey this message. And the second thing is precisely about the, the message. I think that one thing that Europe can usefully uh, reinforce is the belief that it's actually uh, offering the rest of the world uh, something, uh, something which is the conciliation of uh, innovation uh, with the protection of uh, individuals, uh, of democracy with functioning societies, of, um, of, of various identities with a common sense of purpose. Uh, uh, and so it's offering a model. And we should not be shy about saying that life is good in Europe. And that brings responsibilities and that brings, uh, uh, you know, necessary solidarity with the rest of the world. And so if we are more aware of this, uh, that we represent something that is probably good for the future of, uh, uh, of humans, uh, then I think we'll be on a good path. Gerdmark, um, are you as like, do you see, or are you as optimist as the others? And uh, what do you think the European Union has to do to find its place? Um, there are things are happening. <laughs> that's the, that is, you cannot handle the history like a machine. Uh, I agree with, with the words which were said uh, that the European Union was and is also an inspiration. And especially when we talk at the moment about democracy, because also in the United States, for instance, the other big important democracy, uh, there is a big struggle going on about democracy and about uh, the truth. And uh, uh, we, we are a beacon of hope in this crisis. And we are in that way very, very important. And on the other hand, What's helped me too to be to be optimistic is the history of my own country. Once the, the Netherlands were a republic, and when you look at that history, we were that for two centuries till 1795. It was honestly said a mess. Uh, it was one struggle between cities, provinces, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, and uh, Amsterdam had its own foreign politics. Utrecht had its own foreign politics. And the whole thing collapsed. And after two decades, a total new country came out of it, and a very stable country. And uh, it worked rather well in the end. So um, these two centuries of republic, can you see afterwards, indeed, with the rationalization, how you could look at history, as a preface for, at the end, uh, a rather stable, well-functioning country. And when I'm desperate about the union, and I think you, like you all, are sometimes, I think about this history of my own country. There, it, it, it can work out very well, and we learn also a lot in these decades. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Gert Mark. Thanks to the th four panelists. Uh, that was an interesting discussion. We have to close it now. Thanks to the audience and the questions the audience put. I couldn't take all the questions, but I'm sure there will be more room there in the next hours. Um, the Kerber History Forum goes on. Um, we continue with another spotlight after a short break. Uh, the future of Europe and the EU 
And I give then floor to my colleague Andreas Rinke, who will interview Caroline Edstadler, the Austrian Minister for the EU and the Constitution. Thank you. Thanks again to the panelists and thank you, audience.